Okay, in this last video that covers blood vessels, we're going to focus on controlling blood pressure. So the human body controls by using the nervous system and the endocrine system. Uh, so you'll start to realize it seems like every chapter in AMP2, we're including some aspect of the nervous system and we uh, cover some hormones. Uh, and that's because those are the two systems that control and regulate everyone else. So we're focusing on blood pressure. We're looking at how might the body raise blood pressure and then how might the body lower blood pressure. So this slide talks about the baroreceptor reflex. This is a nervous system control of blood pressure. So it starts here at either the carotid arteries or the aorta. Those are the arteries that contain baroreceptors. Baroreceptors monitor blood pressure. So for example, a barometer measures atmospheric pressure. Uh, a baroreceptor monitors blood pressure. These baroreceptors are, in essence, stretch-sensitive receptors. So when blood pressure goes too high, these arteries stretch more than normal, and that activates the receptors. Or, if they don't stretch as much, that's an indication that blood pressure is too low. So the stimulus is either high blood pressure or low blood pressure. That information, basically what the blood pressure is in these arteries, gets sent to the brain using two cranial nerves. The carotid baroreceptors use the glossopharyngeal nerve, whereas the baroreceptors in the aorta use the vagus nerve. So these are sensory neurons that are found in these two nerves that send the signals to the medulla oblongata, which has the cardioregulatory and vasomotor centers. So those are control centers for the heart and blood vessels. If the blood pressure is too high and we're trying to bring that pressure down, the medulla will increase parasympathetic stimulation. So the vagus nerve will bring that parasympathetic stimulation to the heart and slow the heart rate. So parasympathetic stimulation decreases heart rate. If you decrease heart rate, you will decrease cardiac output, and that is a way to decrease blood pressure. If the stimulus was low blood pressure, the medulla oblongata is going to activate sympathetic nerves, which instead of using cranial nerve, vagus, it's going to use these spinal nerves, so the signal comes down the spinal cord, comes out these sympathetic nerves, and then eventually we will use the cardiac accelerator nerves to stimulate the heart to beat faster <clears throat> and harder to increase cardiac output and increase pressure. At the same time, we're going to send sympathetic stimulation to blood vessels. And these blood vessels are going to constrict, which helps to raise blood pressure. So when you study the baroreceptor reflex, just start at the aorta and carotids. Think about, okay, what's going to happen if pressure's too high? All right, follow the, the path, eventually out the parasympathetic. And what's going to happen if the blood pressure is too low? We're going to follow that path but come out the sympathetic division in order to raise blood pressure. All right, so that's how the nervous system helps control blood pressure. How do hormones affect blood pressure? Well, there's a number of different hormones. So the first hormones are your epinephrine and norepinephrine hormones from the adrenal glands, from the adrenal medulla. And remember, these are going to, in essence, do the same thing as sympathetic activity. So these hormones are going to help raise blood pressure by increasing cardiac output, okay, so by increasing heart rate and stroke volume, and then also vasoconstriction, all right? The next hormone is called angiotensin II. This hormone is part of a larger pathway called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway. And we're going to look at that a little closer on the next slide. But angiotensin II increases blood pressure 
by vasoconstriction. A third hormone, also part of that RAA pathway, is aldosterone. And aldosterone can increase blood pressure by reabsorption of sodium. So what that means is retention of sodium at the kidney. And then because you retain sodium, you also retain water. And when you retain water, that is going to help increase your blood volume. All right, so if we can increase blood volume, we can increase blood pressure. A fourth one is ADH, and we recall ADH from the endocrine system. It's going to help increase blood pressure by reabsorption of water. So now notice it's water, not sodium and water. And that's also going to help increase blood volume. This hormone also acts on blood vessels as a vasoconstrictor. Uh, and for that reason, this hormone is often called vasopressin. That's just another name for antidiuretic hormone. So these are five hormones, epi, norepi, angiotensin II, aldosterone, and antidiuretic hormone that all work to keep blood pressure up. The fifth one is the opposite. So atrial natriuretic peptide does the opposite of a lot of these here. So definitely the opposite of aldosterone and ADH. So what the, this hormone does is it's produced by your heart, that's the atrial part, when the heart stretches. So the, the heart will stretch when there's too much volume and pressure. So this hormone is produced when the blood pressure is high. And it targets the kidneys, and it's going to cause the kidney to excrete salt and water. All right. It also acts to vasodilate. So notice that ANP is the opposite of aldosterone and ADH. It vasodilates, and instead of retaining salt and water, it's going to cause the kidney to excrete salt and water. That will bring down blood volume, and that helps to bring down blood pressure. All right. So these are the five hormones. Um, this is a little more visual uh, figure in regards to the RAA pathway. So that's the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone pathway. So this pathway is, is set up in the body to help when your blood pressure gets too low. So that's the stimulus. So let's kind of walk through this figure. Uh, decrease blood pressure. All right, so your blood pressure is too low, your blood volume is too low, is detected by kidneys. So kidneys, here are the kidneys again monitoring blood. Remember we talked about kidneys that they can monitor how many red blood cells you might have. They can also monitor blood pressure. They actually have baroreceptors. So the kidney knows when your blood pressure is too low. When it's too low, it releases an enzyme or a hormone, some people call it a hormone, some people call it an enzyme, called renin. And what renin does is it takes this molecule called angiotensinogen that's produced by your liver and converts it over to angiotensin 1, which is basically just a middleman. That has to get converted to angiotensin 2 by another enzyme called ACE. ACE comes from your lungs. It's called angiotensin converting enzyme. And that's because that's what it does. It converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Once you have angiotensin 2, it's going to be a vasoconstrictor, which again helps to raise pressure. It also stimulates the adrenal glands. This is the adrenal glands, and it stimulates the cortex to secrete aldosterone. And once you have aldosterone, you can retain salt, retain water, which increases volume, which helps increase pressure. All right, so this is a, a pathway using hormones to help raise blood pressure when it gets too low. Uh, ADH, those of you that don't remember ADH, you can use this figure to remind yourself. Uh, ADH is produced uh, when you're dehydrated or when your blood pressure uh, is too low. And remember, ADH is produced by the hypothalamus, transported to the posterior pituitary. When it goes into the blood, it's going to vasoconstrict, which helps raise pressure. It's going to increase 
reabsorption or retention of water. And again, that's going to increase volume and pressure. This figure is one from a previous book, but I happen to like it as kind of an overall review of how both the nervous system and hormones can work all together at the same time to keep blood pressure up. Blood pressure is super important, so you need more than just one way. Uh, you want a short-term way to raise pressure, that's more the nervous system. You want more long-term ways to keep blood pressure up, that's, that's more the hormones. But when you lose volume, we call that hypovolumetric shock, or I should say hypovolemic shock, sorry. So hypovolemic shock means low volume. And low volume means that you're going to have a really hard time distributing oxygen and nutrients throughout the body. So that's a major problem. So stimulus is low volume, low pressure, and that's going to trigger a number of paths. So you'll notice on this figure we've got the stimulus up top, right? Low pressure, low volume. The response at the bottom should be opposite which is increased volume, increased pressure, okay? So how do we get there? There's different ways. One way is you use the RAA path. So we use the renin, angiotensin II, aldosterone, and we ultimately will, if we follow the arrows, we will vasoconstrict, all right, using angiotensin II, and we will retain fluid using aldosterone. All right. The next way we could do it is nervous system. Here's that baroreceptor reflex. We start with the baroreceptors and their carotids and aorta. Signal goes to the medulla. Medulla increases sympathetic stimulation, and we get an increase in cardiac output, and we get vasoconstriction. And then the middle here, we have ADH. Again, that can be triggered because of those baroreceptors. So ADH is going to retain fluid by the kidneys and help increase volume. So there's you know, multiple pathways to help us keep our blood pressure up. All right. So this you know, basically summarizes the previous few slides. Finally, I have kind of the last three slides of the PowerPoint kind of summarizes a lot, but it puts things in either one column or the other. Sometimes that's half the battle. Just plug it in. Does this increase blood pressure or does it decrease blood pressure? So in this slide, we're looking at the autonomic nervous system and hormones. So how does the autonomic nervous system increase blood pressure? Well, it uses sympathetic activity to increase cardiac output and vasoconstrict blood vessels. All right. How does the nervous system decrease blood pressure? We're going to do the opposite. We're going to increase parasympathetic activity, decrease the sympathetic activity, and that will result in a decrease in cardiac output and vasodilation. All right. So here's your autonomic nervous system. Then we've got hormones. On this side, these are all those hormones that are going to raise blood pressure. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, it, they go at two things, cardiac output and blood vessels. The RAAS is going to vasoconstrict, retain sodium and water to increase volume. And then ADH is going to vasoconstrict and increase volume. On the other side, we have two hormones. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator, and then atrial natriuretic peptide is a vasodilator, as well as a hormone that gets rid of sodium and water to lower blood volume. So just a, another way to go over the same information. This next slide brings in more. So what else might increase pressure? Well, maybe someone has atherosclerosis. So this is kind of a chronic condition due to the accumulation of cholesterol and saturated fat in the arteries. What that does is it decreases the lumen, 
and it causes the arteries to become less elastic. So they don't stretch as well. And if you don't stretch as well, that pressure doesn't get relieved, and it can lead to higher pressure. You could have salt sensitivity. So this is when you, you retain water because of the salt in your diet. Some people are more sensitive. So there are some people where just a little bit too much salt can have a dramatic effect on their blood pressure. Stress, smoking, alcohol are linked to hypertension. So is viscosity. So if there's anything that causes blood to become thicker, more viscous, like high red blood cells during polycythemia, that could lead to high blood pressure. And then finally, obesity. And obesity is probably going to be uh, occurring, you, you know, usually you might have atherosclerosis as well, but you'll have to grow those, those blood vessels longer. And when you have more blood vessel length, you have more resistance and you'll have higher pressure. Interesting little thing here, for every one pound of adipose tissue, you have to grow about a mile of new little blood vessels in that tissue. Um, so I always make a joke that during Christmas break, I usually grow about 10 miles of blood vessels. And then I spend the rest of the year trying to lose those blood vessels. Because once you lose adipose, you'll actually lose those blood vessels. All right, let's look at some things that might decrease pressure. Improving your diet and exercise. So that would, you know, be a good thing to do if, if someone develops hypertension. Um, you could lose fluid either by bleeding, hemorrhaging, uh, you could lose volume during dehydration, and you can lose volume if you have low salt uh, in your diet. Finally, you could have anemia, and that's going to cause your blood to become less viscous and can be um, uh, a cause of hypotension or low blood pressure. And then finally, if you lose that weight, you can decrease the blood vessel length. All right, so these are kind of the other things, the, the habits, the, you know, diet, uh, exercise, and, and kind of the other category. The last category is medications. So there's a number of medications that um, have side effects being high blood pressure, uh, and then there's medications we use uh, to lower blood pressure. Uh, so epinephrine is one that could be used in an emergency. So if someone's maybe in the hospital and their blood pressure crashes, they could be given epinephrine uh, to raise pressure. These are some medications that have a side effect. Uh, they can, if you have hypertension already, um, you might want to avoid these, these drugs. So NSAIDs, those are your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like Motrin, uh, Tylenol, uh, SSRIs are a class of antidepressants, uh, ADHD medications could increase blood pressure, birth control, uh, steroids like prednisone, and then some of the decongestants actually can cause high blood pressure. On the other side, these would be medications used to treat hypertension. Beta blockers, so those are going to block epinephrine, norepinephrine, and sympathetic stimulation. Calcium channel inhibitors, those can be used to decrease cardiac output. They also can cause vasodilation of blood vessels. Alpha blockers block the sympathetic stimulation of blood vessels. So these are vasodilators. Uh, nitrates vasodilate. ACE inhibitors. So remember that enzyme ACE that converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. If we block that enzyme, you don't get that production of angiotensin 2 and aldosterone, so blood pressure can actually be lowered. Same is true with angiotensin receptor blockers. If you block that angiotensin, it won't cause that vasoconstriction. And then finally, you could use a diuretic, which causes the body to get rid of fluid. And if you're getting rid of fluid, some of that fluid comes from the bloodstream, and you can lower that blood volume. And again, if you lower blood volume, you can lower blood pressure. 
All right. So this last slide is kind of my clinical connection uh, and gives you kind of an idea why this stuff is so important because if you're moving on to medicine uh, and becoming either a nurse or a doctor or a PA or uh, any of the uh, different medical professionals, this is why we learn this stuff because there's medications that can be either used to mod modify blood pressure or they could have side effects. So that's the end. Um, it's a lot of information, but I think it's a good chapter. Um, let me know if you have any questions as you're studying this material.